All right, so you've been sitting for a little while. Why don't we all stand in honor to the Word of God? And while you're going to Matthew chapter 6, again, I just want to, I've pointed out a few folks that are here, but we've got a number of other guests that are here today, and we just want to extend a great big River of Life welcome. So glad to see you. So glad that you're here. God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being here with us, and uh, we pray that you're blessed to the Lord. Matthew chapter number 6, got a little subject here I want to kind of get into a little bit. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 25. And this is going to be one of those kind of messages that I, I think, you know, the Word of God is highly practical in nature. And it's not all, you know, ethereal up here out of, out of time and space and mind, but it is applicable. And Jesus, the greatest teacher who ever lived, Jesus spent a long protracted period of time teaching a group of people. He wasn't throw down prophetic preaching. He was teaching people because he knew that if people were going to win in life, they needed new concepts. They needed new concepts of life that they could live their life by. And I, I, obviously I want to be in agreement with Jesus and we want you to come and experience God, have a powerful touch of God in your life. But also sometimes, you know, what needs to be rearranged is our minds need to be rearranged. Our thinking needs to be readjusted. And part of the transformation of coming to God is not just the experience of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, but the way in which God transforms your thinking and your mind. I'm just going to tell you right now, I, I was not raised in church, and after I got the Holy Ghost and lived for God for a little while, the way that I thought was a hundred times different after I served God than before I served God. And that's why teaching is important. So I want to take you to one of the most powerful and famous passages in the New Testament, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to excise just a small portion of Scripture, and I want to, I want to talk about this, and... Um, I think it's going to fit some people that are here this morning. If it doesn't fit you, then I want you to kind of fold it up and I want you to put it in your back pocket for the time that it will fit you. Because the time will come that this teaching will fit your life. And you're going to need a response from the Word of God that's going to help you to manage the difficult times of life. And what is our mental predisposition? How are we going to think about these times? Jesus talks about it. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. And we're going to delve into that a little bit, what he's meaning by that. Take no thought, he says, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? Look at your neighbor and say, isn't life more than just food? I mean, I know some of you, it's, it's <laughs> you're like hitting home, preacher, like, get off that. But it's more than that. It's more than just meat and the body for raiment. There are people that spend their entire lives focused on these things, and they don't bring you peace, though. And he says, okay, okay, here's my example. Jesus was a dynamic, wonderful. He's like, okay, now look at, look at the fowl, look at the birds of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. You ever seen a bird flying around? You know, just he's out there and he's got a tool belt on, he's got a hammer on his hip, that bird's flying around. He's building a, a great big barn and storing up all his grains for the next day. He doesn't, he's not doing that because he's not worried about what tomorrow's gonna bring. And Jesus is trying to get a lesson across here. He said, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Go look at that person next to you and say, you're better than a bird. God thinks you're better than a bird. Thank God for that. <laughs> Which of you, he says, by taking thought can add one cubit unto your stature? I'd like to pick on all the short people in church here this morning. And you notice I did not give any height. Some people are height challenged. How many of you can just... And then you measure and you're like, same height I was before. <laughs> Unchanged. You, you, I mean, you can't think your way to greater height. It just doesn't work like that. He said, why, ta why take ye thought for raiment, for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Lilies aren't freaking out. Like, oh, what am I going to wear today? I just... They're just cool, calm, collected, together. 
He's not worried about it. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory, that rich, powerful king, was not arrayed like one of these. I want you to say together with me, God does a good job. Because ultimately, this is an indictment against God. If you ain't being taken care of, let me tell you what, God's going to make sure that you get taken care of in life because he's a good God. He's a good God. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. So don't worry. Don't worry. Some of us get eaten up with worry. Don't worry. God's going to take care of you. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, I mean, this is like a perfect opportunity to talk about weather and time of year. And it's, yes, it's September, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Summer's over. You're going back to school. Grass is going to die. Snow's going to come. Yeah. Yeah, you excited? It's, it's all going to happen. Yep. Yeah. That's where we are. Tomorrow's cast in the oven. It's all going to be gone. Shall, not, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Because this worry thing, this worry thing, it's about faith. Uh, this thing about being eaten up with worry, it's a faith thing. Furthermore, it's an indicator, do I really trust God? <laughs> What's going to happen tomorrow? What's the problem? Oh, what am I going to do? I mean, is that expressing tremendous confidence in how great God is? What's going to happen? What about this? What about what's going to happen here? Where are we going here? What's going to? Oh my goodness! Ah, I think I'm going to freak out. Give me a pill. That's not expressing great faith. He's saying, though, O ye of little faith. Therefore, he said, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's what they're after. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Listen, God knows everything that you need in your life. God's not dumb. He's not ignorant. He knows everything that's going on in my little pea brain. Every little thought, every little issue, every little challenge, everything that's going on surrounding my life and your life. God is fully aware of it. He knows you have need of all these things. Okay, so I want you to raise your hand and say, this is my job now. This is my job. All right. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Mm, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Mm. He said, you do that, your part, put God first in your life. Seek him, seek righteousness. It matters the way you live your life. If you really love God, you're not going to live like a skank. If you love God, you ain't going to be smoking dope Saturday night, coming to church Sunday with your hands in the air saying, oh, praise the Lord. Because righteousness matters to the God that you claim to serve. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know what that means? That if you do your part, God will do his part. And you can be confident of that. Take ye therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What he's saying is, you can't prognosticate the future and look down, what about next year? What about the year after? What about our government? What about what happens in the, in the White House? What about... Da, 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 da? You just drive yourself absolutely nuts. He said, because you know what? There's going to be enough trouble that comes tomorrow and all these other days than for you to be reaching into the future problems and pulling them into your present. He said, but what you need to do is you need to concentrate on today and you need to concentrate on your God and you need to trust in your God and your God is good enough to take care of you. Jesus, bless the word, Lord. It's your word. It's already blessed. I pray the communication, the preaching of the word, Lord. Let it touch hearts and lives. Let it minister, strengthen, teach, train, help, and strengthen, Lord, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning. Thank you for standing. All right, how many worriers do we have in the room today? Let's be honest. How many worriers do we have in the room? At least we got a couple of honest people in the building here today. We got worriers in the room. Hand wringing. 
Right? Okay, at least we're honest. Nervous wreck, pessimist, fatalist. Ah! It's the future gonna break. Ah! You know how your brain can just kind of do that little thing? And it's like association, you think this thought, and you're like, ah! And can I just tell you that there is a concentrated effort from the enemy, and the enemy has got all these tools in his toolbox that he's using. Oh, could I preach against social media this morning? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know why? Because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's, it's on your phone. You can't, I mean, you can get away from it, but you got to make a deliberate effort to get away from it because it's popping up on your phone. It's coming up in your email. It's on the radio. It's everywhere you go. It's, ah. And if, if you, in case you haven't realized, it's always prophesying all the horrible, terrible things that are coming down the pike. Do you know why? It's because that kind of news sells. <laughs> Did, did, did you hear? Did you hear what's going on? And sure, some of it's true. That's, that's the hard part. And after a while, you can, if you get so wrapped up in that, it's going to mess with your head. It's going to mess with your head. Where all you're thinking about is, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Nuclear war. Oh my, what's going to happen to my kids? What about the future? Oh, all the... And all of a sudden, you can get yourself in a tizzy. How many bite their fingernails? I'm not, you, don't, you don't have to raise your hand. I did, when I was a kid, I bit my fingernails. My mother, she bought this stuff to help you for, to stop biting your fingernails. You paint your, your nails with it. You put it in your mouth, and it tasted like acid. <laughs> Thanks. I think I'm cured. But that's, I mean, that's so much of that is, is the human condition. What if, what if this happens? What about that? And then your mind can so easily, why is it? I just, in some ways, it, and it's got to be the carnal mind, it's a frustrating thing, but why is it that our mind so easily goes to the worst place and in the dark? Wouldn't it be cool if our mind always immediately interpreted reality in a way like, wow, this is gonna turn out great? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is going to go really good. I got to meet with my boss today. I bet we're going to have a great meeting. Noah's first thought, like, is he going to fire me? What I do wrong? What I, what I, what I do bad? You know, isn't that crazy? Our mind works like that. And we fret and we worry and we bite our nails and, 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 and all these what-if scenarios. And normally all the what-if scenarios are the worst possible. How, what if this happens? How bad this could be? And, and, and if you're not careful, you just get yourself in a royal tizzy. You're all wrapped up and you're full of angst and nervous and fretful. Ah! And then the people around you are like, man, chill out. But we, we, we can get ourselves all wrapped up in this thing called worrying. And that's a subject I want to deal with today. I want to deal with, I don't, it's been on my mind for a couple of months, but worrying it's such a, it's, it's a human condition. It's so many people are, are so worried. That's a question I want to ask you this morning. How, how often do you find yourself worrying? It's not a conviction statement. It's an assessment. I want you to think, how often do I find myself like, man, what, what about this? And what about that? And you, and you find yourself worrying about things, worrying about life, worrying about your kids, worrying about the future, worrying about America, worrying, and, and, and you just find yourself worrying. I want you to consider that with me this morning. I would say today probably that there are certain people that are more prone than others to worrying. All the moms say amen. <laughs> and why is that? It's because moms care. Right? And because you care, you start thinking about these things. And you're sometimes ladies oftentimes have potentially more worrying to be done than men. Sometimes guys are like, yeah, so what? <laughs> but men do worry, but they worry about different things typically than ladies do. 
Sometimes it can be a temperament thing. There are certain temperaments that certain personality types that are more, more given to, to worry. And it's, you know, internal programming. It's the way that that person is maybe has more of a tendency to view life. Very, 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 very worried. And they spend a lot of time worrying and thinking, what, what about this? And what about that? I, I'd also say that if, if you've gone through terrible life situations and circumstances in your life, if there's been trauma in your life, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, people that have had terrible things happen in their life, it, it can create within the gut of a person like that. If there's been abuse or difficulty or, 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 or things like that in life that also, you, you, you can develop a, a knee-jerk reaction to things. It's just, you're, you're interpreting life through a fear paradigm. I heard a story, this was just, um, I heard a story about a month, month and a half ago, and this young girl, she woke up, true story, she woke up, young girl, she woke up in the middle of the night, and when she woke up, her, her room was pitch dark, but in her room, she normally had a night light, and it, it kind of freaked her out, because the, the room was totally dark, and her night light wasn't on, so she got out of bed, she couldn't see anything, she felt her way along over to the wall, till she found where the light switch was, she found the light switch, and she pushed up the light switch, and the lights didn't come on. About this time, she starts getting eaten up with what in the world? And she's walking along the, the hallway and she's scared. What, what happened? I must have gone blind. I've gone blind. What happened? Was it something I ate? Was it something I drank? I'm blind. I can't see now. No nightlight. The light switch didn't come on. And about that time, her dad was walking down the hallway in the middle of the night because a storm had taken out the power. And he found his daughter that literally had interpreted what happened in her life as that she went blind when really all that happened was they lost power in their house. But you know what? Isn't life like that sometimes that when things happen, the way that we interpret the realities of life and the way that we interpret things that can come to us can be worry-filled. They can be like worst-case scenarios or they can be viewed, what I would advocate for here this morning, according to the word of God, is that we can have a predisposition that says, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe in God. That's what I'm going to do. Because can I just tell you something? Worrying doesn't make things better. I wish that it did. But worry, it eats you from the inside out. Worry. Worry destabilizes your mind you know what I'm talking about when you really man when you really get eaten up with worry all of a sudden you just your mind is starting to get frazzled and, and the confidence and the faith that you had now begins to leak out of your life and, and when you worry and you're eaten up with worry it, it drains your your confidence it's hard to be bold and full of worry at the same time you know what I'm saying it undermines confidence. That feeling that a person can get in the pit of their stomach, just that, that sick feeling. So, oh, when you think about the bad things it could be. So Jesus knows all these things that they present an incredible vulnerability. And I'll say this, um, worry is a faith sucker. It's like a spiritual leech. You know, you have faith, like, that's why, it, can I just tell you, that's why it's so important to come to church. It's so important to, to be in the house of God. Because what happens is in this collective environment, we begin to lift up the Lord. We begin to praise God. And as we praise God, what happens? Our faith, like that turtle, sticks its head out of the shell and start saying, there might be hope. And all of a sudden, as the Holy Ghost begins to move in the place, and this is what I love about God's Spirit, as God's Spirit begins to move, something begins to needle you within to say, hey, maybe things can be better. Maybe there is hope for my situation. I've been walking through six days of pure torment and hell thinking, man, nothing good can come out of this. But I get into the presence of God and all of a sudden something comes outside of my life that tells me maybe there is hope for me today. 
I was praying it right as I stood there right at that front pew, the, 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 the scripture that says that his spirit bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God and have children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. When you get into the presence of God, the Holy Ghost starts reminding you, you really are my son. You really, the devil's been lying to you, saying that you don't fit and you don't belong, but, but the Holy Ghost comes along and says, no, you're my child. I love you. I care for you. I, I'm in your corner. God, listen, God's not against us. God's for us. Even to those that are sinners, he is so for you that he's, he hung on a cross called Calvary and the blood of Calvary, when it dripped into that Judean soil, it was to give hope to the sinner. Hope to the sinner that you don't always have to be a sinner. That you don't have to be broken, lost, messed up, mixed up for the rest of your life. But there's a better way for you. There's a better way. And it's that lifeline of hope that gets thrown to us that I, I don't know about you, but it pulled me out of a very, very dark place in life. And that's God that does that for us because he, he cares for us. But we've got to learn as we walk with God, we've got to learn how to deal with this worry thing. Because listen, worry and fear are cousins. They're, they're traveling companions. Worry and fear are they go hand in hand. They, in many ways, share the same genetics. They are in the same family. How often our lives are influenced by worry, the uncertainties of life. What about sickness? What about my future? What about retirement? What about culture? What about society? What about my family situation that I'm, I'm dealing with right now? What about my kids? Are, are they going to be okay? What about the economy? What about my job? What if such and such happens? What happens if my kids, they get sick? Should I have done that? Did I make the right decision? What about my work? What about my finances? And I think we can very easily find that in our lives there is a low-grade underlying sense of worry sometimes. And I want to expose it this morning in the Word of God. I want to expose it so that God could help us not to live our lives based on worry. Because you know what, there, there can be seasons of life, isn't it, isn't it crazy, where all of a sudden we begin to rise in life and, and hope begins to rise. Uh, the idea that things are going to be better the idea, Nana, we're, we're, we're not, we don't have cancer anymore. We're, we're cancer free. And, and we've got hope that begins to rise. And then all of a sudden, these needling, nagging little doubts can try to creep in, into our brain. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, it's, it's like this. Uh, you're doing good. You get out of church, and all of a sudden, there's a little, little, Little nagging doubts start weaseling their way in. You're at work and you're, you're up there doing your work and just a little. And it, just, and it eats away and it ruins that sense of peace that you have. And you, you may have had a great week, a great month, but something tries to needle and weasel its way into your life and get you to start thinking about all the bad things that can happen, how bad things are. And it tries to eat away at your confidence. I've come to preach here this morning that there's a better way to live life. And Jesus advocates for a better way of life, that we don't have to live in a constant, unending state of worry. That there is an overarching, almighty, good, powerful God who is our Father which is in heaven that oversees all, that knows all, that is still omnipotent. The Lord omnipotent reigneth from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. And beside him there is none else. And he's still in control. And he's still God. Whether your life is upside down, whether you're in a personal place of tragedy, or whether you're on a mountaintop of triumph, he's still the mighty God in the good times and in the bad. 
in the high times and in the low times. The scripture says, I am the Lord and I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still a good God. He's still a powerful God and he's still in control of everything. So when those things come to steal your faith and steal your confidence and cause you to worry, you need to say in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to allow that to eat away at my life. Amen. I will admit to you today, if you've lived any more than about a week, that it's a war sometimes. Sometimes it's a low grade thing that's running in the background of your brain. It's this little thing, a little reptile brain of yours, <laughs> a little thing running in the background trying to get you to fear and doubt. You know, there's another word for worry. Let me, let me give you a 21st century contemporary word for worry. It's going to help a lot of people. I wish I could scream this top of my lungs. I'll try. <laughs> to the whole world. Let me give you another word for worry. It's a contemporary word everybody's going to identify with. Are you ready? Anxiety. Now we hit home. Like worry is one thing. Now anxiety, that's another thing. They say, I think if the statistics are accurate, they say that 40 million Americans, 40 million Americans deal with anxiety disorders. We're not talking about just worry, but these are people that are being prescribed medications to deal with their worry. And I'll just, I'll just say this, and I'm not preaching for or against that. I'm just stating a reality. And I would say that Big Pharma loves you worrying. Yeah, because they got a pill for that. Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Ativan, Zoloft. And 40 million Americans are living with anxiety disorders. And that mental state is being exacerbated by the media. It's being exacerbated by the division in our country. News, inflammatory rhetoric is just stoking that fire. I, feel the whole, I just feel a strength of the Holy Ghost here this morning in addressing this to the church. But God wants you and I, who are his children and his people, that in the middle of a raging storm that is happening in our world... There is a people that have calm in their soul, that have peace in their lives, that there is a people that in the middle of a world that is being manipulated by fear and worry, there are a people whose lives are built on the solid rock Christ Jesus, uh, that come what may, what storms rise in my life, uh, what winds blow in my life, I've built my life upon the rock, uh, and I, I belong to Jesus Christ, uh, and and listen, there is nothing that can come into my life that does not, first of all, have to pass by the God that I serve. There is not a single thing that can come my way that if I serve Jesus doesn't first of all have to come by his permission. And he is not a vindictive God. He's not a hateful God. And if God will bring you to it, God will bring you through it. It doesn't matter how dark the night. It doesn't matter how great the trial. If God be for us, who can be against us? And if God brings us to it, he will bring us through it. He will bring us through the challenges of life because I've got a God I've got a heavenly father I've got trust and confidence in this mighty God we need God in our lives we need him more than we need a pill we need him more than we need a media update we need him more than we need notifications on our phone. We need God operating in our life more than we need every, anything and everything else. Because the key to overcoming worry is a good God that has the answer. We need God. One great preacher made a, a statement, a quote, and I'll share it with you because I think it's so... It's so fitting. He said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Anxiety does not take away the sorrows of tomorrow. It doesn't solve tomorrow's problems. But what it does do is it takes away the strength of today. 
That's why anxiety doesn't help us. And so this thing called worry is a drain and a distraction on all of our spiritual lives and focus. So this term, my message today is the worry wart. The worry wart. Some of you may not realize, I did a little research today because I'm weird like that. Please don't say amen. But I did some research on this word worry wart this past week. And the word worry wart, we think of, when we think of worry wart, what do we think of? We think of the person that, you know, they're always worrying about everything, right? We, that's what we think. Contemporary definition of worry wart, they're a real worry wart. They worry a lot. Or I'm a worry wart. I, I worry about, it's kind of a weird combination, worry wart. It's kind of unattractive, you really think about it. But the word worry wart comes from a, uh, a writer in the 1920s, and there was a cartoon that ran uh, in newspapers all throughout the United States of America for about 60 years' time. And he, this, this man named J.R. Williams drew a character, and the character's name in his cartoon, his, this little boy's name was Worry Wart. His name was Worry Wart. The reason why they named him Worry Wart is because he ran around everywhere causing all kind of trouble. Ah. The little boy who's the cartoon character is running around stirring stuff up everywhere. He's provoking, he's messing with people, he's, you know, he's aggravating people, and he, call, he called him in the cartoon Worry Wart. He was the one that was causing the worry. He was, he was the worry wart. The worry wart was not the person that was worrying. The worry wart was the one that was creating all the worry. Running around trying to get people incited to worry, trying to, you know, mess with them. And, and that's what I want to preach about this morning is the worry wart. And what we're saying today is we're saying no to the worry wart. The things that come masquerading in our lives to cause us to worry, what we're going to do is make a decision and say in the name of Jesus, no. The enemy's will in my life is for me to worry, but God's will in my life is for me to trust in the Lord. The enemy wants me to worry about what if scenarios my whole life and look about what can be and how bad it can be. And he's going around inciting worry in my life. Uh, but what I'm going to do is make up my mind in Jesus' name. I, I, don't, I don't want the worry ward in my life. Uh, I say no to the worry ward. I'm going to trust uh, in the Lord. I'm not going to allow the worry wart to, to annoy me. Man, I feel like preaching here this morning. When that fatalistic question, what if this happened? What if that happened? Then we're going to shut that down in Jesus' name because we don't want the worry wart walking through our lives. I read somewhere in my Bible, what does God think about all this stuff? Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's a big deal. He's like, that's not a good thing. Things that are not of faith. He says in 1 Timothy 2 and 8 that, that all the godly men, they lift up, what do they do? They lift up holy hands without wrath. And we talk about that a lot. Guys, we got to get over our anger. But that's not where he ended. He said, without wrath and without doubting. That deep cynicism that can get within the heart. Like, you know what that's all about? The cynical, critical, the worry wart that comes in trying to undermine all that is good. So we wage war on the worry wart. We say not today, worry wart, in Jesus' name. You're not welcome in my life, worry wart. You're not going to worm your way into my brain. You're not going to have me thinking like that. I refuse to think like that. No, I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm not going to wake up in the morning nor in the middle of the night and live my life based on a foundation of worry and fear. I'm going to build my life based on confidence and faith in God. I'm going to trust in the Lord that takes good care of me. If the Lord has brought me through all this stuff in life and brought me to where I am today, who am I to think otherwise than he's not going to continue to bring me full until the end and keep that which has been committed unto him. He which hath begun a good work is going to bring it to completion. God's going to help me so worry war you're not welcome in my life worry war get out of my life because uh, I'm trusting in the Lord I'm trusting in the Lord 
Praise God. So Jesus, in Matthew 6, he is teaching a group of people that were in the middle of a lot of instability. He was preaching to a nation that was so topsy-turvy. They were literally under the control of another nation. There were rivalries among religious groups, Pharisees and Sadducees. I mean, they just couldn't get it all together. All the religious people, they're fighting with each other. They, they were factions and there were issues. They were looking for a better life. They were overtaxed. There were genuine and bona fide issues that all these people were facing that Jesus was talking to. You know how I know that? Because they were real people. They're like you and they're like me. They were real people. And I'm sure that when Jesus was there on that mountainside teaching them, he could sense coming out of the people there was, there was tension in the air. There was tension. There was fear. There was, there was worries. And Jesus sensed that out of the people and did one of the greatest things that he could do and he addressed the pressing problem which they were facing the problem of worry the concerns that he saw on the faces of tender people many of them sheep without a shepherd some may be crying themselves to sleep at night others were wondering what does the future hold and Jesus gave some of the most reassuring words and concepts that live with us to this day. Interesting that he covered, I would say, the main essential things of life in terms of our overarching worries. Essentially, there are main and primary things that we should or could actually worry about that they're justifiable. In Matthew 6, 25, he said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than, than raiment? Now, how many thinkers we got in the room? I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's good to approach the word of God thinking. Okay, anybody beside me ever thought about this scripture and be like, therefore take no thought for what you shall eat. Does that mean that it's like dinner's at 5 o'clock and it's 4.59? And it's never entered my mind what, I mean... Logically, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Logically, if you're going to make dinner, you probably got to think about dinner. Right? But Jesus just said, take no thought. He just don't even think about it. So you get ready to have dinner and say like, okay, what's for dinner? Well, we're waiting for the spirit to tell us. Well, I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> That's what the word says. Take no thought. It does not, it, what it does not mean is that you never plan your lunch. It doesn't mean that you don't think and coordinate what clothes you're going to wear or you may look like a freak. You're probably going to have to put 30 seconds of thought like this matches with this. You know, I'm not wearing uh, under armor and a sweater to church Sunday. I'm not wearing a great big coat to church. I mean, you got to think about it. So if he's not talking about, you know, some level of planning, what, what is he saying? This word is very, very important. If you're taking notes, I'll give you the spelling of it. It's a Greek word, M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O, merimnau. And what that word think, it's the word think, merimnau. It's, it's the word think, and that word think, it does not mean like mental process. That word literally means to be anxious, or to be heavily worried or heavily concerned. That's what that word means. It means to be heavily concerned about something. I'm so worried about this. I mean, it's not just like I'm thinking about this, but it's like I'm really thinking about this. Like, what's going to happen? What, what, what are we going to do about food? How, 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 what about the kids? It's, it's school starting up. And what are the kids going to wear for, for school? We, we don't have any money for that. I don't, I don't, I don't. What are we going to do? What he's saying here is not to worry about these things because really the mind is what creates worry. What's going to possess my thinking? Am I going to allow my mind to go down certain pathways? Am I going to allow myself to just go down pathways and like build mental castles of all the things, the worst case scenarios and the terrible things that could possibly happen in my life? Because listen, your mental predisposition will bias you toward victory or defeat. We can shout, we can juke, we can jive, we can dance, we can get the 
we don't have one, we'll get one. We'll get a Hammond B3 and we can jam out like Wild Willie on the organ. We can throw down, we can have church, we can whoop, holler, scream, we can speak in tongues and all that. But if I leave and my mind is out of control, I am going to face certain defeat in my life. If everything in my life is going to be worst case scenario, if everything in my life is going to be how bad it's always going to turn out. Listen, that Holy Ghost that God gave you and he gave me is meant to inspire our confidence and our faith that it would spring up into our mind and cause our mind to think faith thoughts and confidence thoughts and trust thoughts. That Holy Ghost within me springs up and allows me to start thinking about the possibility of how good things can be if God gets involved in it. We're not talking about worst case scenarios of the flesh. We're talking about God's spirit in our life is meant to inspire us. It's meant to walk alongside of us and tap us on the shoulder and say, guess what? The future can be better than the past. It's meant to inspire our confidence because Jesus was talking to a troubled people, but he didn't want those people that were going to follow him all the days of their life to live with faithless, worst-case scenarios. But he wanted those people to be a people of faith, to be a people of confidence, to be a people of trust in the Lord, that God is in charge of my life, that God can supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That God can work this situation out for my good. That God is at work in my world today. Though it is sick and though it is dark. Thank God there's a God that's still at work in a world that's trouble filled and sick. And as a Christian I can point out everything that's wrong in the world. Or I can say but there's a God that can make it all right. Oh, praise God. There's a God that can fix it. There's grace that's available. There's the power of the Holy Ghost. There's transforming power of the gospel that can bring about life change. That whatever it is does not always have to be. And we will not surrender to the worrying, anxious thoughts of life. But we will trust in the Lord. Oh, praise God. And that's what Jesus is fundamentally, he's, because the worry wart is running around pointing out everything that's wrong. The worry wart is there messing with your head, whispering in your ear, inspiring you to faithlessness and fear. But God is there massaging your faith and strengthening your faith and helping you to be all that God wants you to do and to be. Here's my little example, all right? These always get very dangerous, (laughs) okay? This is our lives, right? I, I do find it interesting, the Bible says that they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, isn't that filled? And there's all kinds of deposits there. You realize there's deposits being made in your life. There's withdrawals, but there's also deposits. You spend some time in God's word. I'll tell you what I've been reading lately. I I found a a hardcover copy of the Amplified Bible, and I'm absolutely loving it. Because it's so full. And and you know what? You get get into that scripture, and you get filled, right? You get word in you. You're like, whoa, that fits for my day today. You spend time in prayer and, 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 and whatever your mental predisposition is when you go into prayer. I don't know about you, but when I leave prayer, I leave different than the way that I entered prayer. Almost always. Because there's a filling that happens. And then you come to church and, and you fellowship and you shake somebody's hand and you come walking in the door. And you're like, I'm so glad that I came. Devil was lying when you were laying in bed and you're like, man, just turn that alarm off. How many people have social, I'm not, this is a rhetorical question. How many people have social anxiety? It's a real thing. And are like, I'm, I, man, going to church, like I get all tense when I think about it. I'm going to be around all these people. But you do what God's word tells you to do. That's why, you know why you go to church? You go to church because God's word tells you to go to church. If you don't go to church, you're disobeying God. I mean, it's, don't take it up with me. Don't take it up with God. That's what God said. You go to church. But God knows even in spite of your social anxiety, if you want to call it that, 
I get tired of labels, but call it. And, but, but you come and all of a sudden what happens? You're like, oh, that was so good. So reassuring. I heard something that helped me. Somebody came up and put their hand on me and they, and they prayed for me and spoke a few words. They were simple. They didn't even know what they were saying. They were just simple little words, but those words, they just filled me. And this is the state that God wants us to be in. And then along the way, what comes? Monday comes around and you're like, you have a bad, I need some help here. You have a bad exchange with, your, with one of your coworkers and it's like, And all of a sudden, you have a bad fight with your wife or husband. You know what I call that? I call that a drain. And, and worry, that's what worry is. It's a drain. You get all filled up and you're like, oh, life is so much better. Life is good. I feel good about life. And all of a sudden, something punches you. How many know what I'm talking about? How am I going to pay that bill? What am I going to do about that? And I got a grandbaby that's going to be born today. And there's a crying baby. And I didn't sleep too good at night. What are we going to do? The worry work comes along. See, look at that. And you know what happens? You, you might, and I, I'm convinced, this is a visual picture of what happens in people's spiritual lives. It's a visual picture. They get filled up. Like, I, I'm new in the church. So glad to be in church. I love God. I love God so much, church. I, I, I love living for Jesus. I'm going to heaven. And all of a sudden, troubles of life start coming. And it tries to just drain. Now, Tim, I don't know if this is even going to work. Probably not. Sense all my faith there. <laughs> Help me out. Try to... But God has a better plan. It works. It works. It works. Then you go, but you go back to God. You go back to God in prayer and say, I'm not going to be that kind of person. No. Nope. Worry wart. No, I'm coming to God with my faith. The word of God tells me that he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. The word of God tells me that if God be for me, who can be against me? The word of God tells me that nothing can separate me from the love of God. It says that not tribulation, nor distress, uh, nor height, nor depth, uh, any other creature is going to be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, Jesus told me, don't take any thought for the morrow. I'm putting my little drill away. I'm not going to let the worry war come into my life uh, and punch me full of holes uh, because that's what will happen if you let it. You may be strong one day, but given a week, a month, a year, you keep worrying and all that strength that you had in your life is going to dissipate and it's going to disappear. That that's why we need a fresh infilling. We need a fresh in. First off, plug the holes. I'm trusting God. I'm believing God. God, we got to learn how to start speaking some of these things. God's going to help me with this. And then furthermore, you start getting filled back up again. Yep, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down beside uh, uh, green pastures and still waters. I've got a God that's on my side. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear and of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is at my right hand that I should not be moved. Are you ready? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to take this one down. Because you can magnify God or you can magnify your problem but you cannot magnify both. 
I'll say it again. You can magnify God or you can magnify your problem, but you cannot magnify them both. It's one or the other. I can magnify my problem. Oh, you don't know how bad this is. You're not going to believe my life. Oh, yes, yeah, this is impossible. Empire, you, you have no idea. You know, blah, 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 blah. or you can be, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to magnify the Lord. I tell you how you tell a stalwart Christian saint of God. A stalwart Christian saint of God is someone that has learned in living for God long enough in life that no matter what happens in my life, my response will always be the same. And that is, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'll just say it like this, because there are people I know you don't know that are, are solid saints that you have no idea what they've been going through in life. And when, when they're here, you're going to look at them and you're not going to know any different whether they're going through hell on earth uh, or whether they're living through heaven on earth. You're not going to tell the difference because what they've learned is I put my trust in God either way. I'm not going to get in a f freaky mindset. I'm not going to allow myself to get tossed hither and yon. I am going to trust in the Lord. And those people have a mental, mental intentionality in their lives. They put pull their thoughts in. They put their faith in God and the Lord stabilizes them. Worry destabilizes. The worry wart gets you looking at everything that's wrong. But Jesus said, don't think about those things. Take no thought. Don't worry about those things. He said, behold the fowls of the air for they sow not, neither do they reap. You see him? Tweet, 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 tweet. Tweet, 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 tweet. You see him? Does he look worried to you? You're like, man, he's lost it. <laughs> you get home, you look out the bird feeder. Are they like, <laughs> I need a pill. Help me out. They know it's, it's going to show up. They don't reap. They don't gather into barns that your fa heavenly father feedeth them. And then he asks what should be a rhetorical question. Are you not much better than they? Are you better than that little bird? Little bird that's flying around. You're, aren't you better than that? God wants you to know you're, you're better than that. He says, why talk, take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the lilies. I'm using it, Mariah. Inside joke. I mean, is this, does this little dude look freaked out? What am I going to do? Go out in the fields. Put your ear to the ground. Listen. Do you hear him freaking out? Are they worrying? Like, here's a psychiatrist couch. <laughs> Tell me about your problems. No. They don't, they don't, they don't worry. They're not, they're not worrying. They're not like getting up every morning and checking the S&P. Like, how are my investments doing today? Oh, they're doing bad. Oh, they're doing good. Who's in the White House? Uh. Oh, my guy's in the governor. Huh. Oh, look at my checking account. Uh. They're just like, peace out, man. Peace, Lily. <laughs> I just made that up. Yeah. They just trust. It's just, there's, there's no worry. There's the bird, the lily, and the worry wart. The lily says, man, I ain't worrying. I want you to know that it's possible to live your life saying what if in a negative way in every sense, or you can live your life in such a way that you say, I belong to God. I belong to God. In fact, let me, let, me, let me talk a little about spiritual maturity. 1 John 3, 20, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. 
If you deal with condemnation in your heart and in your life regularly, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I don't measure up, I'm not this, I'm not that, and all your attention is on you, can I tell you, I do have good news for you. This is not an indictment. You may be new. You may be working your way through some of these things. If that's where you are, the scripture says God is greater than your heart. If your heart is condemning you, let me tell you what, God's greater than your heart. God can even bring you through that self-condemnation. He can do that. In fact, that's his will. He wants you to be stable and strong. But listen to the next verse, verse 21, 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God confidence toward God. If our heart condemns us not, you know what God wants out of our lives? What God wants out of our lives is for us to live in a rock solid confidence in him. Why? Because he is my father. He's good. He cares for me. He cares about me. He knows everything about everything. He knows my thoughts are far off. He knows what's going on in my life. He's got a future for me. He's got a destiny in my life. He's got a future that will be bright and beautiful. He's got a plan. And because of that I will trust in him because God is a good God he's a good father and he takes care of his children it may not always be the way that we want it to be taken care of or how we think it should be taken care of but the fact of the matter is that he is a good God and when it's all said and done he takes good care of all of us when it's all said and done and our lives are all wrapped up we're going to be able to say the Lord has brought me this far I've never seen the righteous forsaken never see a seed begging bread if there's one thing I know I know that God's been good to me in the balance when it's all said and done the Lord has taken care of me and I thank him for that praise God music come I'm done the Bible says in Philippians 4 and 6 be careful for nothing now that word careful is a word that's changed its meaning to many of us Careful, it means full of anxious care. Careful. It says, don't be like that about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. I'm going to bring this to God in prayer. I'm not going to, what's going to, he said, but everything, he said of anxious worry, he said, I'm go to God in prayer and supplication. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. And I like this, with thanksgiving. I just go, oh God, what am I going to, ah, what am I going to, ah. Thank you, Lord. You've been good to me. You've taken care of me. You are who you say you are. You are the great I am. You are all those things and so much more. So I thank you, Jesus. I remember that time five years ago. We were up against it. Our back was against the wall. Lord, I thank you that you brought us through that. You took good care of us. Oh, praise you. But I got this problem right now. <laughs> but see, see the approach? But God, you've been good to me. Let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving, prayer, and supplication. I'm not going to worry. Other translations say, stop perpetually worrying. And what he recognizes, the habitual attitude, mostly among the unsaved, but can weasel its way into the saved. He said, stop perpetually worrying about even one thing. We're not, we're not going to worry. First Peter 5 and 7 says it like this, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. It's the same word. Casting all your worry. Okay, I've got, I am, I've got a concern here. I'm casting that upon you, Lord. I'm, I'm giving you this, this worry. Stand together with me this morning.